Welcome, everyone. I am Mireya Solis, Director of the Center for East Asia Policy Studies at the Brookings Institution. Thank you very much for joining us for today's webinar, Liberal Order Undone, question mark, Japan's leadership role after Abe. This webinar is a collaboration with the Asia Pacific Initiative, one of Japan's leading think tanks. API launched a couple of years ago a project on Japan and the liberal international order, which resulted in a book published by Brookings Press earlier this year by the title of The Crisis of Liberal Internationalism. And I certainly recommend everyone to read uh, the book. We will, of course, reflect on the insights of that volume, but 2020 has been a year of drastic and profound changes that we will uh, be discussing today as well. Besieged by more coercive Chinese diplomacy, a severe inward turn in the United States amid dysfunction of the political system, and the worst global public health and economic crisis of our lifetimes due to COVID-19, the liberal international order appears to be at a breaking point. However, one of the objectives of today's session is to do what is perhaps hardest to do at this juncture, and that is to find positive trends regarding actors, coalitions, issue areas where rules-based order and multilateralism can endure and hopefully expand, with a special focus on how Japan, collaborating with like-minded countries, can play a constructive role in these efforts. Today's conversation will be moderated by Dr. Yuichi Hosoya, Research Director at the Asia Pacific Initiative and Professor at Keio University, and whom I regard as one of the most insightful experts on Asian security dynam dynamics and Japan's foreign policy. Dr. Hosoya, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Milea. And uh, good morning, everyone in the United States, and good morning uh, and uh, good evening to a uh, viewer in Japan, and also a uh, good afternoon to my friends in Europe. Uh, it's my greatest pleasure to be able to introduce such a wonderful, gorgeous panelist. Today we will discuss on the future of liberal international order and particularly on Japan's role in leading in and uh, also defending it. And I think that uh, uh, we can gather really, really the best panelists on the topic. And let me introduce briefly each panelist. First of all, uh, Dr. Yoichi Fudabashi, thank you very much for joining us. And Dr. Fudabashi is an award-winning Japanese journalist, columnist, and author. He has written extensively on foreign affairs, the US-Japan alliance, and uh, he served as a correspondent uh, for the Asahi Shimbun in Beijing and Washington, and later as editor-in-chief. And then after his retirement, he established the Rebuilt Japan Initiative Foundation, an independent think tank, and uh, Tokyo-based think tank in September 2011, which expanded to become the current Asia Pacific Initiative where he is now president. And then uh, let me introduce Professor Joe Eikenberry, of course, naturally he is the most suited to, uh, panelist on this topic. Uh, Professor Joe Eikenberry is the Albert Milbank Professor of, Polit uh, Professor of Politics and International Affairs at the Princeton University. And uh, of course he is very famous for his books like uh, Libela Libayathan, but also uh, I'm proud of being his translator into Japanese language. I translated his liberal order and imperial ambition into Japanese language, which is widely uh, read among Japanese students. And then let me introduce, thank you very much. Let me introduce uh, Dr. Hans Kundani. Uh, Dr. Kundani is a senior research fellow in the European program at Chatham House. Before joining uh, Chatham House in 2018, he was senior transatlantic fellow at the German Marshall Fund of the United States and the research director at the European Council for Relations. Thank you very much, Hans, for joining us. Thank you for having me. And then let me introduce Celine Pajon. Celine Pajon is head of Japan's research at the Center for Asian Studies of the French Institute of International Relations in Paris, a leading French think tank, where she has been a research fellow since 2008. She's also a senior fellow with the Japan program of Brussels Free University, as she is this year. Uh, hello, 
uh, Celine, thank you very much for joining us. And uh, I'd like to uh, begin with uh, Dr. Funabashi's uh, remark, comment. I really like to ask him uh, on the reason why you uh, uh, wanted to begin this project of liberal international order, particularly focus on Japanese law. Uh, I shall, uh, can, can we share with your wisdom? Thank you very much, Funabashi. I'm sorry, you are still muted, so could you unmute? Uh, yes, okay, thank you very much. Okay. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Hosea, for being a moderator of this session. And uh, uh, first, let me extend my, uh, express my deep gratitude for uh, Dr. Solis uh, and uh, the Brookings Institution for hosting uh, the seminar. I, I'm very much delighted to be a part of that. Uh, I also uh, welcome our European friends uh, for uh, joining this session. Uh, as Miria uh, graciously mentioned, uh, we published a book uh, titled uh, The Crisis of Liberal International in Japan, the World Order, uh, last February. Uh, which I authored with John Eikenberry. Um, uh, exactly, uh, uh, it was around exactly the uh, time when uh, COVID-19 uh, started to break out. And I did not expect that uh, far-reaching impact that COVID-19 would have in the, uh, in the following months. And the COVID-19 uh, really has deteriorated and weakened that uh, rule-based multilateral uh, international order. Uh, it has given a, a good excuse for uh, many uh, countries uh, to uh, uh, pursue mercantilistic uh, approach uh, in trade. And also it has uh, given some uh, good uh, uh, pretext for uh, the, uh, the governments uh, to uh, come up with uh, uh, new measures, uh, such as uh, very much uh, strict measures uh, like uh, lock lockdowns and uh, in which uh, it could uh, uh, threaten and uh, even com uh, and compromise that uh, liberty and privacy. So, uh, y you know, uh, some, uh, certainly it, it, it is uh, inevitable and necessary for, at least necessary for governments uh, to resort to those uh, strict measures, but it must be temporary and it must be rule-based and the based on the uh, rule of law. Uh, but uh, some countries such as China uh, actually has uh, uh, resorted to very uh, illiberal uh, measures. Uh, and uh, in some areas in the world, it is gaining more currency. Uh, so uh, that also has uh, uh, posed us some serious risks to the rule-based multilateral order. And also on top of that, we are witnessing the uh, uh, divided politics and divided so societies uh, being very much exposed as we have uh, tried to tackle with that uh, coronavirus. Uh, uh, the COVID-19 does not respect any borders uh, or you know any uh, political uh, uh, nature of political regime, uh, they just uh, uh, you know uh, respect that efficiency and effectiveness of the measures against virus. So um, combined with all those factors, uh, uh, we are seeing that the international order, the multilateral and rule-based. Uh, being much, very much afraid and at least very much challenged. Um, 
Japan actually has managed rather well, uh, if not very well. Uh, Japan's uh, mortality rate uh, per one million people uh, stands uh, at eight, eight per one million. Um, actually, it is uh, uh, one twelfth uh, of Germany, which perhaps uh, it has been the best performer among the European countries, and one fiftieth uh, uh, of the United States and one eightieth of the United Kingdom. Uh, so perhaps among G7 countries, Japan has uh, perham, per, uh, perhaps uh, performed most effectively. Among G20 countries, uh, Japan is ranked third, uh, uh, only after uh, China and Korea. Australia is the fourth. Uh, Korea has uh, five per one million uh, death rate. And China, it is uh, at three. So uh, Japan uh, has managed pretty, relatively well, uh, even though it's a bit lagging behind somewhat uh, among that more uh, effective uh, East Asian countries. And so in post-corona world, East Asia perhaps may uh, uh, come forward as more powerful, but more influential player in the world. But the question uh, must uh, should be what kind of uh, uh, rules and norms uh, are older that East Asia uh, is envisioning and uh, also pushing forward. And uh, uh, at this juncture, in this context, I think Japan's role are very much important. Uh, and uh, uh, throughout uh, Abe administration, uh, it seems to me that Japan has evolved uh, two roles, international roles that it has explored. Uh, one is a rule shaper, and another one is a, 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 a proactive stabilizer. A rule shaper is much uh, uh, most uh, uh, well exemplified as Japan's effort to uh, lead the push for the CPTPP after uh, the United States withdraw from uh, TPP. Uh, and uh, with regard to uh, uh, proactive stabilizer, uh, that means uh, Japan can and should uh, uh, play a balancing role play a balancer vis-a-vis -vis China's challenge to uh, a multilateral rule-based uh, international order. And uh, it, perhaps it is very symbolic for Suga administration, uh, which has pledged to continue Abe's foreign policy, uh, including those two roles I uh, described, uh, to host that Quad uh, meeting at uh, the foreign minister level in Tokyo two weeks ago, uh, that, that the Quad was is composed of Japan, United States, Australia, and India, and uh, it was actually envisioned and conceived uh, uh, and put forward in the first ab administration almost 15 years ago. But now uh, this is gaining perhaps more uh, momentum. Uh, much perhaps due to China's uh, 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 aggressiveness and challenge to the uh, rule-based international order. So um, those are the pictures that I am now uh, uh, seeing uh, and uh, 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 that has also uh, Japan's uh, international role uh, that uh, can be very much, I think, important. Thank you, very much. Yeah. thank you very much, in the, the, Dr. Funabashi. I uh, thank you particularly for covering so many important issues, including, of course, COVID-19 crisis and its impact upon Japanese role. Then I move to uh, Professor Eikenberry John. I really like to ask you whether you are more optimistic than before 
of course, there are so many crises and uh, difficulty challenges now uh, that the United States is confronting. And But uh, in your most recent article entitled The Next Level Order, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I felt uh, that you uh, become a little bit more uh, before uh, if I compare to your uh, three years before article, the plot against American foreign policy. So let me ask you uh, your current feeling or your current understanding about the state of liberal international order. Could you also unmute uh, the button, please? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Hosoya. It's great to be here and it's been a real pleasure to work with Dr. Funabashi on this book and to continue what has been a really a, several decades of conversations about US-Japan relations, global orders and trilateral relations. Um, I, to answer your question, I, 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 I'll start with the bad news. I, I do think that we're, uh, since the, the, the early uh, period, three years ago, when we started this conversation, uh, things have gotten worse. I think we do see a, 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 a continued breakdown in uh, a crisis of, of the liberal international order, a, a kind of sense of a, a world historical moment that this is not just another blip in the road. Uh, that in some sense, the long era of experiment by liberal democracies in creating an open uh, world system in which open societies can operate is really being put to the test. Can we still build and recreate an, uh, open societies operating in an open international order? The COVID crisis, I think, has made things worse. As Dr. Funabashi said, I think illuminating problems that were already there and making, making them worse, uh, nationalism, great power politics, uh, the weakening of liberal democracy, putting rule of law and, and uh, uh, Republican constitutional forms of government to the test. And of course, the, the Trump administration has uh, meanwhile uh, been uh, extraordinarily and dramatically uh, weakening the the rule-based open system with a whole series of ongoing withdrawals and, and efforts to, to club and bludgeon the uh, international uh, institutions that we've taken for granted from the Paris Agreement to the WHO to arms control, which we don't talk a lot about, the Iran deal, open skies, INF, uh, and of course threatening the WTO and, uh, and NATO and uh, uh, alliances in East Asia. This is occurring, of course, in a broader uh, context of a kind of general global um, uh, uh, decline in optimism that there are common solutions to common problems, a kind of lack of confidence that we have uh, solutions to our, our problems and that we can work together uh, uh, to, to address them. I think the problems are deeper than than Trump, uh, I, I we, we can point to a kind of uh, decline in internationalist elites in the, certainly in the United States, but I think in other countries, tracing it back to uh, various earlier moments, the 2008 financial crisis, uh, the Iraq war, the kind of undermining of, uh, you might call it a center right and center left uh, internationalism. But, uh, is all lost. And here I would just simply uh, say it, 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 in the other half of my remarks that uh, there are some glimmerings of, of hope, I would say. Um, and I'll mention four uh, 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 ways in which one might uh, sort of uh, see a, a pathway forward towards rebuilding, reform, reconstruction, relegitimation of, of an open rule-based system. One is I think that the current uh, Trump experiment in America first foreign policy uh, is, is failing. Uh, uh, probably uh, he will be rejected in the polls, we don't know, but, but apart from that, there's a sense that uh, the American people and the world has, has looked at this direction and said, uh, maybe we don't wanna go there. Uh, there's a kind of what I would call a backlash to the backlash uh, that has had some impact in, in stimulating new thinking about the next uh, era of multilateral cooperation. Secondly, 
the problems keep getting worse. Uh, the pandemic is in some ways a, a poster child uh, for why you can't go it alone. You can't be secure alone. You can only be secure together. Um, the weakest link is everybody's problem. The weakest public health system in the most remote country can generate viruses that can come in and, and attack everybody else. And that's true across the realm, economics as well. Uh, one remembers the 1930s when it was not a virus, but it was bad economics. It was mercantilism, beggar thy neighbor policies. Thirdly, there have been, and this is what our book uh, tries to focus on with a particular focus on Japan, new stakeholders and constituencies for multilateralism, kind of new champions, Japan being very important in this, but also other what we'll call middle power countries, Canada, Australia, South Korea, and Europe in its own way. I would note last year in, in, in the spring of 2019, there was formed, I think under the, the leadership of Germany and France, something called the, the Alliance for Multilateralism. 50 countries have signed up and they have a whole program. So that's a kind of new, it doesn't, they aren't waiting for the United States to, to shake off this craziness and come back. Uh, uh, but so there is a kind of new, uh, a new energy, I would say, uh, particularly in the democratic world and the, the, the newer states in that democratic world looking for ways to make a difference, uh, rule shapers and stabilizers, as Dr. Funabashi said. And then finally, uh, we'll call it the China threat. Uh, China uh, has uh, uh, galvanized a lot of thinking about whether uh, it's really uh, time to let go of the idea of a liberal international order. It, it actually looks more attractive uh, to the extent that liberal order is a multifaceted system of, of coalitions, alliance, alignments, institutions, security cooperation, and so forth. So I, it may well be the, the bad news for US-China relations may be good news for some kind of pragmatic, world-weary, um, uh, uh, sober um, uh, effort to reconstruct something that we might loosely call a liberal international order. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Professor Eikenberry. Uh, maybe I was wrong. Uh, you are not so uh, optimistic, of course, but uh, everyone is now pessimists. And it's very difficult to be optimistic at this very difficult time. But uh, in the last two or three decades, I have always thought that you try to find something, uh, uh, some glimmering light, even during the dark years or dark time. So well, this time again, I thought that you are trying to, with many difficulties and challenges, you tr also trying to find some light uh, during the darkness. So that's why I thought that I could find some lights in your article. But anyway, thank you very much for your insight. Then I moved to uh, Hans. Of course, uh, European Union Europe is important as Professor Eikenberry mentioned. And I really like to know uh, whether the EU can save the liberal international order. Can you uh, share your wisdom? Thank you, Yuichi, and, and, and thank you to um, API and Funibashi-san and, and Brookings for, um, for having me in this um, webinar and, and uh, in the project. I'm delighted to be involved in it. Um, so, so, you know, yes, I, I'll try to answer that question about the role that the EU can play in defending or rescuing the liberal international order. But um, in order to do that, I, I want to sort of spend a few minutes just um, sort of interrogating the concept of the liberal international order a little bit. So I hope this won't get too the theoretical, but, but I think it's um, important in terms of um, trying to understand what kind of role the EU might play. Um, so I'm going to talk um, a little bit about um, some of the sort of complexities and internal tensions in the idea of the liberal international order. Um, it seems to me that there are all kinds of complexities. You know, the liberal international order has evolved. Um, it contains different elements um, and it's functioned differently in different parts of the world. So, for example, the European security order is quite different from the Asian security order. Um, the particular complexity, though, that I want to spend just a few minutes talking about um, now is um, the sort of the, the liberalism of the liberal international order. Um, in, in other words, you know, in, in what sense is the liberal international order liberal? 
Um, and it seems to me that when we talk about it being liberal, actually we mean three slightly different senses of the concept of liberalism. Um, and, and there's a tendency, I think, in some of the discussions to sort of elide them or at least um, sort of assume that they go together. Um, I think it's worth sort of breaking them down. So the first, I think, is a sort of an economic sense of liberalism, liberalism as opposed to protectionism or economic nationalism, in other words, an open trading system. Um, the second is a sort of political idea of liberalism, um, liberalism as opposed to authoritarianism. So the liberal international order is, is kind of seen to sort of favour democracies. Um, I think this is a little bit problematic, though, because it sort of rests on an assumption that liberalism is sort of synonymous with democracy. Um, and it's not. Um, you know, in a domestic context, for example, um, seems to me that liberalism, by which we would normally mean, you know, a system of individual rights guaranteed by a constitution, actually constrains democracy, understood as popular sovereignty. They're kind of in tension with each other, the liberal element of liberal democracy and the democratic element of, of liberal democracy. Um, and I think that one of the, the causes of the crisis of liberal democracy that we're seeing is the way that the balance between those two elements of liberal democracy has kind of gone. Um, in particular, um, you know, the, the sort of constitutional element um, has become, um, you know, much more um, uh, dominant than it, than it used to be. So some people talk about constitutionalization or depoliticization. Um, so that's the sort of political sense of, 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 of um, liberalism. And then the third, I think, is a sort of IR sense of liberalism. In other words, liberalism as opposed to realism, I suppose, or other theories of international relations. Um, and so this is where I think the rules element comes in, you know, the expansion of rules in international power, international politics, replacing um, power politics. Um, and that, I think, can be thought of as sort of depoliticization at the international level. Um, but I think, so, so in other words, just as sort of constitutions constrain popular sovereignty in the domestic context, these kinds of rules constrain national sovereignty in an international context. And obviously the two things, popular sovereignty and national sovereignty kind of go together quite in quite a intimate kind of way. So this all brings me to the EU, because it seems to me that um, at least in those second and third senses of um, uh, of liberalism, in other words, in the sort of political sense and in the IR sense. It seems to me that the EU is itself even more liberal than the global order is. It's a kind of an extreme form in a regional context of the liberal international order. Um, it's often called a sort of thicker version of the liberal international order, but I think it's important to say it's more liberal. And the reason I say that is because um, I think its liberalism has produced an even more intense backlash than the one you have against the liberal international order as a whole. Um, there's, an inter there's an internal backlash against this kind of thicker or more liberal version of the liberal international order that the EU is really struggling with and has been struggling with, you know, especially during the last decade or so. And so in order to answer the question, you know, whether the EU can do anything, you know, particularly working with Japan, to rescue the liberal international order or save it or defend it, I think often this internal dimension gets missed. And um, that actually, you know, if, you, if the EU is going to be able to do that, it has to first of all, first of all solve these internal problems. Um, and I think probably in the end, um, that's the biggest contribution that the EU can make as opposed to individual member states like France and the UK that I think can play a different role particularly in terms of Asian security. But in terms of the EU, I think the biggest contribution that it can make to saving the liberal international order is to solve this internal crisis. And in particular, and this is where I'll end, to show how it's possible to get a balance between on the one hand, openness and deep integration, and on the other hand, sovereignty and democracy. Thank you very much, Terrific. And uh, now we are talking about the importance of uh, uh, European role or, or, the, or the role of the European Union. Then I'd like, like to ask Celine on the importance of uh, 
EU Japan partnership because uh, now we are seeing the difficulty of the United States in finding a leadership role in defending liberal international order. Then naturally, the European Union and Japan should play a larger role. And you have written uh, many articles about EU Japan relations. So I like to ask you about the importance of EU Japan partnership, please. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Hosoya san. I would like first to thank the two organizers for having me for this great panel today and uh, taking me on this uh, very exciting project. Um, so we try to uh, bring a more uh, rosy or positive light on what the EU can do on the international scene, especially with Japan. And I think regarding the, your question on the, on the importance or significance of the, of the partnership for the liberal international order, actually the, the, the reply, the response is quite straightforward um, because I believe that the, despite Japan and EU are quite distant player, if you look at them geographically, they are you know, not in the same uh, strategic environment, not uh, the same kind of actor uh, at all. Despite this distance, actually both uh, actors devoted a lot of, of energies uh, in the past uh, years, uh, recent years, to build up and to uh, elaborate and organize their partnership. And they did that precisely because he realized that the liberal international order was challenged and those challenges also affected their interests. And so they, they, they realized that there were they, they had many things in common. They were actually like-minded partners on that and they should come together and try to address those challenges. So I think this is the, the, the simple big <laughs> answer to your, to your question. And I think the particularly three developments uh, uh, pushed uh, the EU and Japan to, to come closer and work together. And we mentioned that, that uh, previously in, uh, in the various um, interventions. And the first is the Brexit, uh, which affected both the EU and, uh, and Japan in different ways, but was also a strong um, signal on the international scene regarding what kind of trends uh, we are going to. The second uh, development was the election of Donald Trump and uh, one of the early uh, decision to withdraw from the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which was a shock for the, the Japanese, uh, but not only, also for, for the Europeans, I, I believe. And uh, the third uh, we already mentioned is a more assertive China, a China that um, was um, influence uh, expanded, especially through its BRI, uh, Belt and Road Initiative, all the way, not only in Asia, but all the way to, to Europe. So I think facing these challenges, the commonality of the, the two partners, the EU and, and Japan, really became quite obvious. Uh, as you know, both Japan and the EU um, support and uphold uh, democratic and liberal value, uh, the, the rule-based order, multilateralism, and free trade system. Um, and so despite they belong to very different geostrategic contexts, um, I think it was important for them uh, to stand up uh, and play a role of, as uh, two pillars for the multilateral uh, rules-based world order. And um, they did that. This, this formed the basis for the partnership. And in recent years, we've seen uh, an acceleration in the way they build up uh, their cooperation, uh, in particular through uh, three different uh, treaties or very important uh, documents. The first one being the, the EPA, uh, the Economic Partnership Agreement. The negotiation started back in 2013, but there was a clear acceleration in 2017 because of the realization of these this challenges in, in, uh, in the world order. And the treaty on, uh, entered into force last year in February. And it is very significant because uh, it's the largest uh, free trade agreement. Um, it's covering a third of the world GDP. Um, and not only it make uh, the EU and Japan the flag bearer for the free trade, as Shinzo Abe put it, 
But I think it's not only about the liberalization of, of the trade, it's also um, trying to, to set the stage and provide uh, some uh, benchmark uh, regarding uh, strong high level standards and norm uh, regarding labor, trade, environmental uh, protection, and so on. And in this way, if you remember the word of the former EU commissioner, Cecilia Malmström, she labeled the EPA a kind of strategic alliance between the EU and Japan. And I think it's, it's quite telling of the uh, significance of um, the agreement, uh, especially <laughs> if you look at the EPA along with the CPTPP that uh, you rightly said that uh, Japan pushed also. Uh, was very uh, proactive to, uh, to, to promote. So if you look at the EPA and uh, the CPP, CPTPP, you can find a very strong, solid basis for um, uh, um, another uh, stage for the, the world order uh, on a multilateral uh, basis with, with ambitious norms. Um, the second um, treaty is the SPA, uh, the Strategic Partnership Agreement. And this legally commits uh, the two players to promote uh, the liberal values and principle on the world stage. And it provides a very comprehensive list of areas for cooperation in getting from uh, maritime security, which is very important also for the, for the partnership, to uh, non-proliferation, uh, environmental protections, and, and so on. Um, a third important document is the Partnership for the st on Sustainable Connectivity and Quality Infrastructure, and this was signed uh, last year, last September, and it creates a synergy uh, between Japan's free and open Indo-Pacific strategy or, or vision and the EU uh, connectivity uh, strategy. Uh, it was designed also as uh, providing one alternative to the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative uh, regarding connectivity and, and infrastructure in the Indo-Pacific, but also beyond in uh, Europe, uh, Africa, and, uh, and elsewhere. So I think the three documents uh, provide a very strong, a very solid basis uh, to propel uh, the partnership in the years to come. And maybe let me finish with a few words regarding the impact of the COVID crisis. I very much uh, share uh, Professor Eikenberry's uh, opinion that it's getting the things quite worse uh, because in, in a way uh, it's damaging uh, a multilateral system more and it's also um, worsening uh, the competition, the strategic rivalries between uh, the US and, and China. Uh, but I think in this context, it's also providing some space for the third power such as uh, the EU and Japan to come together and try to provide their own way, the third way uh, out of this uh, bilateral co competition. Um, and the COVID crisis is also pointing to priority areas for cooperation in a way to, to show the way for the, for the two uh, partners to work together on health governance, uh, for example, uh, on the digital data protection cybersecurity, disinformation, and so on. I think the two players have a lot, has a lot um, to share and, and to promote on the international stage. And, and just a last word on the post Abe era, I believe that uh, the Europe and the EU-Japan partnership will still be very important for the, the Suga government. Uh, just to mention the, the very recent uh, visit from the foreign minister Motegi in Europe and the exchanges with colleagues from France, uh, Germany, but also he visited Portugal, who will take the next uh, presidency uh, chairing for, for the EU. So this show really the, the importance for, for Japan, I believe. Thank you. Thank you very much, Celine, for deepening and broadening our discussion by focusing on the EU-Japan relations. I now think that if Japan acts alone, of course, Japanese influence is limited, but if Japan used several tools such as EU-Japan relations, EPA-SPA and US-Japan alliance, of course, CPTPP, by using, I think, these tools, Japan can exercise its influence in international politics in a positive way. So in this sense, I'd like to ask Milia on your view on how 
Abe administration and Suga administration now can play important role in international affairs. Um, thank you very much, uh, Yuichi San, and uh, it's been wonderful to listen to all these presentations. And then um, let me address that question by focusing on one uh, very important dimension, really a core element of the liberal international order, and that is the free trading system. Um, and it has played such a central role um, as part of the international order because basically what the architects were trying to do was to avoid the mistakes of the past. We had learned, painfully learned, that uh, if we were to turn inward, if we were to let rampant protectionism, tit for tat trade wars, we knew what the costs of that were, uh, diminished economic opportunities and uh, greatly increased the frictions among uh, states. So the idea, if you will, was to strive for a system where common rules apply to all members, where you would mitigate unilateralism, and when you would have due process to resolve uh, commercial disputes among members. Now, obviously, the politics of trade uh, uh, never really matched the ideal of the liberal international order, but I think it's fair to say uh, that we have probably never been farthest away from that ideal as we are today. So it is indeed a very complicated uh, picture. Even before COVID-19 shook us all up, uh, protectionism was on the rise, tariff walls were uh, increasing, the volume of international trade was down, the largest economies in the world were locked in a trade war and were increasingly using defensive measures to battle for technological supremacy, and the WTO was adrift with its inability to update rules, to deliver new rounds of multilateral trade liberalization and to enforce the rules that uh, were already there in the multilateral uh, system. Now, assessing how we got to this point is very complicated uh, point. Obviously, uh, will take me far more than my uh, five minutes. But let me just uh, make the point that the actions of the great powers are of major consequence. And therefore, I would like to point to what I refer to as the uh, China challenge and then talk about the role of the United States. So when I, uh, when I bring up the uh, notion of the China challenge, what I have in mind is basically the leadership's recommitment to state capitalism model by doubling down on market distorting subsidies and industrial policy. It's much greater ambitions to dominate new technologies and to acquire self-sufficiency in key sectors, which would also reduce uh, relations of economic interdependence with other partners. And the more brazen use of coercive diplomacy that we have seen on the part from uh, China, especially during the uh, uh, years, uh, uh, the months of the pandemic. Now, uh, but it's not only China, the United States, who is also the architect of the system, now also poses a major challenge to its survival. Uh, the inward turn, the profound political polarization and dysfunction have been decades in the making. But America first trade policy does represent a distinct challenge, unbridled, unrestrained unilateralism. In essence, the Trump administration decided to go it alone in taking on the China challenge, withdrawing from the TPP, resorting to WTO illegal tariffs against China, and abusing national security tariffs to harass allies and partners. And the results are plain to see, just as uh, John also referred to. What we're seeing is an expansion, not a reduction of the trade deficit, uh, for, uh, first deal, um, uh, first stage deal with China that does not get to the concerns over its industrial policy and the inability to put together an effective coalition of like-minded countries to address the China challenge. But again, as I promised, uh, I'm trying also to find uh, aspects of um, where there's promise, where there's hope. It's not just all a, bl a bleak picture. And one of the positive trends in these turbulent years is what we have found leadership where very few expected to find it. And here I'm referring to uh, Japan. Um, I have recently written an article that goes by the title of the underappreciated power. And uh, what I tried to do there is to highlight, of course, leaders matter and what Prime Minister Abe did in overcoming some of the domestic obstacles to Japan's leadership is very significant. But I, what I was trying to capture in that article is also the longer term trends that also position Japan well play a more proactive role at this stage. 
And let me sum it as this. Mature liberal democracies that have coped successfully with economic uh, uh, globalization and where illiberalism has not thrived, has not prospered, are in short supply. And Japan is one of them. And Japan actually has now embarked on a very robust economic statecraft. It is about trade diplomacy. It is about infrastructure finance in developing uh, countries. It is about providing rules for the digital economy. And all of this comes together in an uh, ambitious connectivity agenda for the Indo-Pacific, where the United States, quite frankly, has left a vacuum and where Japan has stepped in to provide alternatives to developing countries. So China is not the only show in town. The record over the past three years is impressive. Japan helped bring to fruition three mega trade agreements, the CPTPP, the agreement with the European Union that, uh, that Celine just referred to, and the uh, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, which is expected to be signed by all members except India at the end of this uh, month. And I do expect that uh, Prime Minister Suga will double down on these initiatives because they have been winning initiatives uh, for Japan and because the whole of government approach is already very much in place. But the challenges are still very daunting and the Suga administration will also have to uh, double down and be very creative given the, um, the uh, issues that are now uh, before us. Uh, first of all, it's important to consolidate, to re-energize the CPTPP. This means encouraging countries who have not ratified yet to do so and bringing new members. It's also very important for Japan to offer a, a blueprint for WTO reform, especially what to do about the uh, uh, enforcement of uh, trade rules. And finally, an, an issue where I think that Japan has actually been quiet and should be far more proactive, we now expect much more from Japan, is uh, ensuring that medical supply chains remain open and vibrant to address with the COVID-19 crisis. And let me end with this point. What is being tested, it's not uh, uh, Japan's own capabilities, but a larger premise, a larger uh, uh, idea as to where the future order that we're transitioning to uh, can be, there can be a role for middle powers to have the capability, the ability to uh, help shore up and uh, uh, the rules-based order. And what I want uh, to finally uh, say is that we're indeed in a transition point and that we're not going back to the status quo ante. So when we think about rules-based order international trade, we're thinking about plurilaterals. We're thinking about regional and trans-regional agreements. We're thinking about international deals that cover specific functional areas. We're thinking about overlapping memberships. And that is the uh, uh, future that we're now heading where hopefully Japan, the United States, uh, elections matter. We'll see what happens in a couple of weeks here. And then the European Union can uh, find ways to uh, 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 sustain these liberal international order. So I end up here. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Milia, for your insightful comments. Uh, within 10 minutes, uh, we will go into a Q&A &A session. And uh, to do that Q&A &A session with audience, uh, we like to have a question by uh, either Twitter or email address. Email address is events at Brookings Edu. And the Twitter account is uh, at Brookings FP using hashtag after Abe. So by using either Twitter or email, uh, we are collecting email uh, uh, questions. So far uh, I get many interesting questions, but before that, I like to uh, ask two, two co-editors of this book, Crisis of Liberal Internationalism, uh, Dr. Funabash and Joe Eikenberry, on how we can avoid the end of liberal international order. Uh, we have seen so many pessimistic views about the future of liberal international order. Some people, scholars are saying the death of liberal international order by the current coronavirus. And I like to know whether you agree with or not. And I like to know how we can overcome these challenges or difficulties. Uh, we have only uh, five to 10 minutes. And uh, uh, so uh, it would be difficult for me to uh, uh, collect uh, answers from all the panelists. So I just like to, first of all, ask Dr. Funabashi and Professor Aikenberg to co-author, co-editors of this book. So uh, Dr. Funabashi, can I have your view on the future of how to save the liberal international order under the current difficulties? Ah, 
Could you also unmute, please? Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Jose. Uh, good question. Um, I think uh, uh, the best uh, way to uh, tackle with this uh, challenge uh, to undermine uh, liberal international order uh, is to uh, make our society more resilient and co cohesive. Um, uh, as uh, uh, John F. Kennedy uh, once uh, wrote uh, just before his uh, death, um, uh, a nation can be no stronger abroad than she's at home. And I think that it's, it's really uh, aptly described uh, the challenges, how uh, we uh, really uh, should uh, uh, re-engage ourselves uh, with the world uh, to uh, rebuild the uh, rule-based multilateral order. Uh, the first and foremost, uh, you have to put your house in order. And uh, more than that, given that, uh, that uh, being uh, highly politically divided and socially divided, uh, I think it is uh, very much imperative uh, to, uh, for each country, particularly advanced uh, uh, economies, uh, to uh, really make it uh, that societies uh, more resilient and cohesive. Thank you very much, very much indeed, Dr. Hunabashi. And then I, can I have uh, your view, Professor Aikenbe? John, please. Yes, I, I definitely wholeheartedly agree with Dr. Hunabashi that uh, uh, internationalism and liberal order abroad uh, is, is dependent on some kind of successful liberal democratic system at home. And I think that um, we can't move forward internationally without our industrial societies uh, uh, retrenching and finding a new way to to make uh, the, the the fruits of growth and development widely shared. I think uh, our societies are are not functioning as they were during the golden era of liberal internationalism. So that that certainly is part of the the challenge uh, uh, we have. I think the other uh, challenge is to be more modest and pragmatic about what we mean by building and rebuilding liberal international order. Uh, in the aftermath of the Cold War, I think there was a sense that the, uh, the deck of history was stacked in favor of liberal democracy, that, that it was an, kind of an inevitable mar march of, 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 of liberal democracy. And, and we now know clearly that's not true and that, that you have to uh, struggle and uh, there's a kind of uh, long, uh, never-ending effort to 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 solve problems and secure your principles, uh, and uh, it may not include large parts of the world. So, I think what beyond domestic reform, I think that there needs to be a kind of new, sober realization that the liberal democracies have to kind of come back together again. That uh, they they have one more effort uh, uh, before the world uh, changes radically and forever to, 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 um, to, to build an order that, that is built around uh, uh, values of liberal democracy. Uh, and so uh, I would say in the next cycle, when we uh, reach rock bottom and we try to, to build up again, the liberal democracies have to come back together in some form. They do have shared interests. They do uh, uh, have an unusual capacity to, uh, to cooperate. And uh, whether it's the old G7, probably not, but it might be a D10 or a D12, a group of, 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 of leading democratic states that want to drive the agenda for reform. This doesn't mean building a circling the wagons and and leaving Russia and China on the outside, but it does mean that it's going to be, a, a, as I think several of our panelists suggested, a, a more complicated international order with levels and, and layers of alignments and, uh, uh, and subsystems of cooperation. Uh, so I think uh, the, 
challenge will be to rediscover that uh, that set of shared values and interests that liberal democracies have. I think Hans was absolutely right. This will be my final point. Liberal democracies are are built around tensions and the values they share. Think about it. Liber, uh, liberty and equality coming out of the French Revolution, individualism and community, sovereignty and interdependence. They are, they are values that can never be uh, maximized without undermining other values that you also care about. So it's always balancing and rebalancing. And the key virtue of a liberal international order is that it creates a kind of ecosystem, a kind of, uh, a, a kind of environment in which liberal democracies can engage in uh, management of their societies so that they can balance those competing values. I, I, I think in the end, the, the 21st century is a, going to be a struggle for what kind of, what kind of life you want to have. Uh, do you care about uh, free speech? Do you care about accountable government? Do you want countries that have civil societies? the rule of law, these are all on the table now. They aren't things we can take for granted. And as we rebuild the international order, we should try to create conditions so that we can uh, save uh, values that we want to uh, protect and pass on to our children and grandchildren. Well, thank you very much, John. Your uh, response is extremely uh, variable. Thank you very much indeed. And I, before uh, 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 picking up some of the questions which relate to Japanese foreign policy, I'd like to ask Hans uh, to, to respond to uh, Professor Eichenberg's comment now. Uh, maybe I think that you have some response to his comment. Well, no, I mean, I, I think we agree. Um, I suppose I'll just spell out something which I think uh, we agree on, and, and John can tell me if, he's, if, he, if this is incorrect. I mean, I suppose my answer to your question, how do you avoid the end of the liberal international order? My slightly flippant answer to that is um, the best way to, you know, the, the best way to, you know, the, the most likely way that we're gonna destroy the liberal international order, it seems to me, is by refusing to reform it. You know, in other words, so, so I think that we, we should not just be thinking, this would be the central point for me, we shouldn't just be thinking about defending the liberal international order, we also need to be think about thinking about reforming it. Um, and, and so in other words, this kind of defensive crouch, I think is, 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 you know, is, is actually a little bit counterproductive. This is why I sort of emphasized at the beginning, you know, it, the liberal international order has evolved. And I, and I just think we're at a moment where it needs to evolve again. So I really liked, um, you know, Professor Eikenbury's adjectives um, or, or verbs rather. Um, you know, you talked about rebuilding, reforming, reconstructing, and re-legitimating. I think that's exactly right. And, and I suppose my, you know, what, what I'm slightly um, sort of uncomfortable with in some of the discussions around the liberal international order, it seems to be you know, there seems to be an impulse to uncritically defend everything rather than saying, well, look, maybe there are some aspects of the liberal international order, you know, that, 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 you know, it's now clear have gone a bit wrong and we need to reform them. And I would suggest, particularly on the economic side, um, and I think you've written this, Professor Eikenbury, as well, you know, I, I just think we need to focus as much on reform as on, on defending the liberal international order. Thank you very much indeed. Then I like to move forward to picking up some questions relating to Japanese foreign policy. And of course, uh, we have uh, really uh, leading experts on Japanese foreign policy, uh, Celine and Milias, and also uh, Dr. Funabashi. So I like to uh, put some of the questions to you. First, uh, well, I, I will read several questions. It's really uh, 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 questions from all over the world. One question is relating to uh, TPP. Uh, under a Biden administration, how do you think about the possibility of the United States returning to the TPP? Uh, this is uh, one question. Uh, the other question is the Trump administration is increasingly showing interest in the Quad framework to counter China, but the President Trump does not speak enthusiastically about the Quad. Do you find any disconnection here? And if so, what would you the impact? What would be the impact? And do you think a Biden administration will also place emphasis on the Quad? 
uh, th these are questions from uh, Kyodo News Agency. And then I like to pick up some other questions like uh, interesting question is uh, a question from Mexico. Will Japan enter into a new era of prime ministers succeeding one another for very short time, maybe every year? Uh, of course, uh, these are concerns uh, many might have uh, uh, felt perhaps. And the other one is, how does Japan view well, Mongolia and other small countries in that regional rivalry with China? A question from Mongolia. Of course, uh, uh, there are many smaller countries around China and they really fear, I guess, the regional rivalry between United States and China and Japan and China. So how do you assess their concerns? So uh, first I'd like to ask uh, both uh, Celine and Amelia uh, if you have some answer to these <coughs> questions. Celine, uh, do you have some uh, response to these questions? Yeah, maybe I will uh, leave the, the question on the TPP for Mireya. <laughs> I think it makes sense. Uh, but I can um, speak a few words on the quad. Uh, that was interesting uh, indeed to see the Quad uh, Summit taking place in, in Tokyo uh, very recently. And uh, we had uh, uh, Mr. Pompeo making a lot of, um, of uh, declaration about his uh, willingness to uh, institutionalize his wish, at least to institutionalize the Quad. Uh, but I'm, I'm not sure that uh, this would be actually a good idea if you look at the at actually the um, what came out of the of the quad summit this time there was not a one joint communique it was still four different declarations from the four different countries so I think that uh, even if they share uh, a lot of interest uh, values and so on they also have different differing vision for the, the regional orders. And I think as uh, Mireya said, we are going to, to see, and we are already in a very fluid uh, environment, uh, with a sort of transition from the old world to the, to the new one, the next one. And uh, all the countries are adjusting uh, their posture uh, all the time, are trying to navigate a very, um, instable and uncertain times. So I'm not sure in this context that um, I wanted to, to formalize or institutionalize uh, one um, group as a quad uh, would be uh, very productive uh, actually because it would force the country to, to take side uh, and to be more um, vocal on their uh, position, maybe tosser on their positions. And maybe in, in our um, you know, era, it's good to, to keep a, a bit of a kind of strategic ambiguity or <laughs> strategic posture at some point. And um, I'm thinking um, about uh, you know, how France is developing its own uh, Indo-Pacific approach. Uh, he, he has a lot in common with, uh, with Japan and other countries in the region. He's developing um, his partnership with India, Australia, of course, with the US too. We share a lot, but also uh, France wants to keep its own kind of strategic autonomy and strategic space in the region. So, so far it has been reluctant to, to join or to associate with the Quad, for example. So I think it would be um, important to keep a flexible mechanism for cooperation, maybe not de jure uh, institution, but uh, de facto on the ground, we will see a lot of different kind of initiative, a lot of different kind of, of cooperation going on. And I think it would be the way that, uh, um, that the partnership, uh, cooperation and the regional and world order will uh, develop in the future. Thank you very much indeed. Then, Milia, the possibility of the United States within the TPP under the Biden administration, if not some association. Yes, uh, thank you for that question. Um, you know, um, I think that the um, situation of US-China strategic competition is here to stay with us. 
And that obviously is going to be a key element in thinking about how the Biden administration is going to think about uh, the regional economic architecture. But even if you come with a diagnosis that China has recommitted to its state capitalism uh, model, and it's important that the United States remain a very present uh, actor in the region, um, you know, the United, uh, the United States under Biden could decide to play this strategic competition very differently and, uh, you know, avoid using unilateral tariffs against allies, recommit to a multilateral effort. So there is more possibilities, I think. However, we have to be realistic. And a lot has happened since the United States step out of the TPP. For one, countries in the region found it uh, uh, possible for them to relaunch that into the CPTPP. That successor agreement is not identical to the regional TPP. It's close to it. It suspended 12 provisions on intellectual property. But that's the one that uh, countries ratified. And that's the one that realistically the United States would now be uh, seeking accession uh, to. Second, uh, the United States has then negotiated since uh, a US-Mexico-Canada trade agreement that it's important to note had bipartisan support here in the United States. So when you think about the politics of trade in the United States and what is feasible, we have to look at that agreement. And where uh, it obviously incorporated many elements of the TPP, it modernized NAFTA doing that. It also have some provisions that are trade restricting and that have, for example, the clause on not negotiating trade agreements with non-market economies, aka China. And I'm not sure how TPP countries or how Asian countries would react to that formulation. Moreover, uh, what uh, we've seen from you know, the uh, Biden campaign's documents on trade policy, there's a big emphasis on made in America and buy in America. And I understand that this is campaign season and that uh, uh, this could change, but nevertheless, it's hard to see uh, how these would actually be seen very favorably among many other countries where the idea is that you're promoting onshoring and when you're promoting buying American made products first and foremost. So there are a lot of issues to be uh, solved. And I would imagine that in any possible renegotiation that it would allow the United States to come back to the uh, CPTPP, if I were negotiating on the other side, I would certainly would have uh, uh, in my mind to introduce some safeguards to prevent these sudden swifts in American trade policy. And for example, to make sure that we're not going to have executive agreements that can be dismissed by the next administration, to make sure that Congress gets to say a role, and perhaps to have some provisions to make sure that the, unilat the, the national security type cannot be abused. So again, it's going to be interesting uh, to watch in the next few years. And, uh, thank you very much indeed. And uh, uh, I have a few more questions. So, uh, of course, you don't have to answer all of these questions, but let me just lead up some of the interesting questions. One is relating to non-proliferation. What kind of role Japan will play in protecting the future of the nu nuclear non-proliferation and disarmament architecture? How can Japan make China more responsible for uh, incentivize its involvement in nuclear arms control future further. I, I think that the latter one is more important. How Japan and international community can encourage China to join in some of the international frameworks, including, of course, non-proliferation. And the other question is, uh, what will be Japan's role in addressing the climate crisis? Of course, I suppose that the Biden administration would be quite interested in promoting some agreements in climate change. And of course, Japan should be a partner as well as uh, European Union and uh, Germany or some other leading European countries. So uh, there are many issues, pressing issues, but uh, I think that we have just seven minutes. So I will I like to. I would like to provide you one minute each if you have some response to that. And Dr. Funabashi, do you have some response to this question or just a closing remark? One minute. One minute. Uh, I would like to respond to the inquiry about the Quad. Uh, some would like to see Quad evolving into uh, Asian NATO uh, uh, as a Quad being a nucleus of the future Asian NATO. Prime Minister uh, Suga uh, is not interested in uh, do, uh, developing that uh, into that uh, uh, treaty-based 
uh, a, a new alliance or semi-alliance system. Uh, perhaps uh, he did not elaborate that why he was opposed to that. He, he actually opposed to that uh, in public, but uh, it certainly will be very much counterproductive. Uh, and uh, basically, I think a quad is, has been driven by the uh, maritime Asia's uh, uh, increasingly uh, uh, deepening concern about China's challenge to the maritime security and uh, free of navigation uh, and uh, the order. So uh, I think that, that's a glue, that, that's a primary driver uh, for, uh, for, for countries to uh, now uh, get together. Uh, also, I think that uh, there is something missing in Quad that is geoeconomic aspect. Uh, because that is where that uh, we are now confronted most acutely uh, by uh, China's challenge to uh, the liberal international order right now. It's not a nuclear proliferation issue, uh, you know, uh, but, but geoeconomic, uh, economic statecraft issues. So uh, I think a free and open Indo-Pacific concept and, uh, 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 and the vision, uh, I think must uh, be uh, given more flesh. Uh, uh, to the bones. Thank you very much. To be quite precise and relevant, John, do you have some final remark? Some final remarks. I think that if there's going to be a another cycle of history that that uh, includes the the a, a kind of center role of the liberal internationalism in the global order, uh, U.S. and Japan are going to need to work very closely together. They 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 have deep alignments of values and interests that just have to be at the center of the next cycle. Uh, obviously, uh, geostrategic interests, uh, climate change, both countries, I think the United States, there's a deep social uh, 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 kind of urge or set of pressures, primarily coming from the from younger people, the next generation on getting serious about climate change. And, uh, and, and the US and Japan have a lot to learn from each other and to work together on, on sustainable energy. Um, and then I think finally, when we reimagine and reform global institutions, both countries have, I, I think a set of values they would like to, to make sure get embedded or remain embedded in those institutions, transparency, rule of law, uh, peer uh, review, um, uh, civil society, uh, um, all these, what I would call liberal values that uh, are are out there waiting to to kind of be be defended. So I think all roads lead to uh, to U.S. Japan uh, cooperation uh, in the context of of a very of, of a multitude of, of of overlapping larger coalitions. But I think it has to be at the center of the next effort. Thank you very much indeed. And you too have been the core of the bond of the US Japan relations for many decades. Thank you very much. And Hans, do you have last words? Yeah, I guess I'll just reiterate what I was kind of driving at earlier, which is I think we need to be careful not to think about this in a very binary way, that it's a very straightforward struggle between liberalism and illiberalism. It seems to me a little bit more complicated than that. And let me just give one example, which relates to something we discussed uh, and also the UK, um, which hasn't been mentioned so far. So, you know, I thought it was interesting when Celine began her remarks, you know, she talked about the, these two shocks in 2016 that led the EU to sort of, you know, realize there's a threat to the liberal international order, which were Trump and, and Brexit. Um, and, you know, she specifically mentioned then, you know, the Trump administration withdrawing from TPP. It's quite interesting, I think, that actually the UK post Brexit wants to join CP, CPTPP. Um, and I think that sort of illustrates that it's, it's, this is a little bit complicated. Well, thank you very much indeed again for your sophisticated response to the difficult question. So Celine, do you have some final comments? Uh, just, just a few words on the, on the question how to encourage China to join international frameworks and uh, play by the rules and so on. Um, I believe the, the way the Prime Minister Abe tried to, uh, 
to engage conditionally with China is, uh, is a good idea. The way he opened the door for possible cooperation on the Belt and Road Initiative, for example, it's quite interesting because he put a lot of, of condition on that and maybe with the hope of uh, some, uh, some at some point if, if China would need the, uh, the backing of, of Japan for a project or two, well, China has to uh, actually take this condition into account and uh, work on a more sustainable quality infrastructure um, uh, kind of, of project. So I think this is a, would be a, a good way to, to try to, uh, to work and, and engage with China. If China wants to be engaged, as the Japanese always say, we cannot engage China if it doesn't want to do that. And uh, another, another point, I think it would be uh, interesting to be very precise and uh, details about the, the terminologies that we use with China and what we put behind words, because we are talking a lot about multilateralism and, uh, and China is presenting itself as a champion of multilateralism and is reaching out to the European to say, well, you see, we have all, all of this in common for multilateralism and free trade and so on. And the US, the Trump administration is not on this uh, uh, road at all. So we should work together. But of course, what we, we have in mind from Europe regarding free trade and multilateralism and what the Chinese have in mind are very uh, different. So we should uh, be able to uh, really uh, try to uh, figure out and define clearly the term of the debate. Thank you very much indeed. So last, Milea, could you wrap up all the rich discussion in a minute? And that's impossible, but uh, just on the uh, very important point, how can we generate meaningful, effective cooperation among liberal democracies without also triggering a zero-sum competition with authoritarian powers? I would say, look at what Japan, Japan is doing. Japan's multi-track strategy actually has been effective. You know, it has the quad with uh, like-minded uh, democracies, and uh, it's an initiative that, as we've discussed, is expanding, but also has the CPTPP, where there's high-level standards with countries at different levels of development and countries that are not liberal democracies, and then also is trying to generate incentives for China in infrastructure finance to abide by uh, finance standards that promote rule of law, transparency, and uh, therefore I think that it's possible to do so if you actually want to be uh, uh, active and engage in different fronts, and I think it would be an important uh, trajectory to follow. Well, thank you very much, brilliant. Uh, with this, uh, we can end today's web webinar. And uh, I was the one who was most eager to listen to your view. And I was, I'm really satisfied with the really rich insightful comments. And uh, so that's why I like to end this webinar with by, by well, cheering up your excellent jobs uh, in the early morning in the United States and uh, dinner time uh, in Japan. But anyway, thank you very much. We will like to continue this kind of uh, research and debates because I believe that the liberal international order will not die. Thank you very much indeed for your participation. Thank you very much. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.